Hello and welcome, good evening or whatever time of the day it is from where you're watching. Welcome to this first in our annual series of London lectures from the Royal Institute of Philosophy. The series has been going for many, many decades and this is the first time we have had to go online, but we're hoping to turn that to our advantage. It means you can join us no matter where you are in the world. It also means you'll be able to watch the lectures afterwards online for forever, as long as YouTube exists and we continue to exist. And hopefully we will wear more than compensate for the losses of being together in person. Our series this year is called A Philosopher's Manifesto, and this is a very grammatically precise title. It is a manifesto. Uh, philosophers are a very diverse bunch, and we're not attempting or pretending we're presenting the views of philosophers as a class. And it is, but it's a philosopher's manifesto, plural. So watch where the apostrophe goes. Uh, it, it's individual philosophers giving their own views. Each philosopher has been invited in this series to basically argue philosophically the case for some kind of policy or law which they think could make a genuine improvement to politics. We're trying to show how philosophy is of use and a practical benefit to the world. We're also trying to show how the importance of having a philosophical argument for uh, the, the, in politics today, which is particularly important, I think, at a time where politics has, in many parts of the world, become very shrill and factional. And we've got a very, very diverse range of speakers from all over the world, from different philosophical traditions. We're kicking off the series with what's going to be a very interesting talk by Thaddeus Metz, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. And he's written over 250 books and articles and chapters, and many of them are on African philosophy. And such is his contribution to the global understanding of African philosophy and its importance. He was named as one of the world's top 50 thinkers by Prospect magazine for that work. He is going to be making the case his, for his manifesto of uh, reconciliatory sentencing. We're going to hear the talk and then there'll be a chance for you to ask questions. Please do type away your questions uh, below in the YouTube interface and I'll be able to see them as they come up. Um, so for the moment, let's begin and enjoy the talk with Thaddeus Metz. Today, I want to talk about some issues in the philosophy of punishment and in particular about what might justify punishment on behalf of, on the part of the government. Um, I'm gonna to articulate two philosophies that are prominent in Western philosophy and culture more generally. I'm going to suggest that uh, they both have some serious problems. Then I'm going to draw on resources from the African tradition of philosophy and construct a novel account of punishment uh, in terms of reconciliation. And I'm going to argue that it avoids the problems uh, facing uh, the Western theories and that it's intuitively attractive and something uh, we should take seriously as an alternative. More specifically, here are the questions about punishment that I want to uh, answer uh, in today's talk. The first question is broadly about what the point of punishment is. Why is it permissible for the state to impose penalties on its citizens or others? Um, what makes it okay for the government to lock people in cages or to take their money in the form of fines or potentially to execute them? Um, under what conditions uh, is it just for the government to treat individuals that way? That's one question. Second question I want to address is how to punish people. So imagine you're a judge and you have an offender before you and you have a decision to make about exactly uh, how much punishment you're going to mete out to that person and what sort of penalty that individual is going to receive. Should the penalty fit the nature of the crime? Should you look backward into the past uh, uh, to see what the offender did and base the penalty on facts about that? Or instead, should you look forward uh, into the future and consider what the effects of given penalties will be? For a good 200 years, uh, uh, two philosophies have dominated uh, 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 answers to those two questions. Uh, one familiar answer uh, in Western philosophy is the retributive or payback model of punishment. And one of the first uh, uh, exponents of the view was Immanuel Kant, uh, writing in his book, The Metaphysics of Morals in 1797. 
And according to Kant and retributivists more generally, the reason the government is justified in punishing people is that some people deserve it uh, for the crimes they've committed. So it's possible to, to deserve good things or bad things. Um, an example of deserving something good would be working hard at a job and then uh, deserving a raise or a promotion. Conversely, uh, though, uh, one can deserve negative or bad things. And in particular, retributivists think that if you commit a crime uh, and harm or treat somebody in a degrading manner, you can deserve a penalty. Uh, if you haven't committed a crime, uh, then you don't deserve any penalty. And that explains, according to this theory, why it would be unjust for the government to punish you. As to the question of how much to punish, the dessert theorist says whatever fits the nature of the crime already committed. So if we look at the job example, if you uh, uh, have done very, very well at a job, you deserve a better reward than if you've just only done moderately well at a job. And analogously, uh, uh, the worse the crime you've committed, the more severe the punishment should be. And more specifically, uh, the retributivist thinks that the appropriate penalty for you is whatever fits or is strictly proportionate to the crime you've committed. So if you've kidnapped somebody, uh, uh, the retributivist would naturally say that the punishment you deserve is prison, to be locked up in a cage yourself. Similarly, if you've committed murder, death would be uh, an appropriate penalty. That would be fitting or proportionate to what you've done. The retributive model is backward looking. It tells us to base our punishment on facts about the past, namely what the offender did. In contrast, the other major answer in Western philosophy to my two uh, questions about what justifies punishment is forward looking. It tells us that in order for punishment to be justified, it has to be expected to have certain consequences down the road. So as to the first question, uh, why punish or when punish, the point of punishment according to the protection theory, as I'll call it, is to protect society from crime in the future. In particular, the point of punishment is to deter crime or to incapacitate would-be offenders. By deterrence, I mean instill fear in people who might be thinking of committing crime. And by incapacitate, I mean render unable to commit any further crime. As to the question of how much to punish uh, uh, individuals, according to the protection theory, one ought to impose whichever penalty would prevent the most crime, uh, perhaps without being disproportionately severe. So for example, uh, uh, we might want a certain amount of prison time to incapacitate an offender. And although there is disagreement amongst criminologists about whether the death penalty deters murder, if it does, uh, then the protection theorist could well recommend the death penalty in order to deter crime. So notice uh, that uh, uh, the retributive theory and the protection theory both converge uh, in often recommending prison and perhaps even the death penalty as justified penalties. But their rationales for these penalties differ. According to the retributivist, uh, uh, prison or the death penalty in principle can be deserved for what an offender did. And according to the protection theorist, these can be justified as ways of protecting society from crime in the future. Uh, a representative of the protection theory is Jeremy Bentham, uh, pictured on the slide. And in 1780, uh, in his book, The Introduction to the Principles of Morals and Legislation, he expounded a version of the protection theory uh, in some great detail. Those are our two major Western theories of the justification of punishment. And I want to now uh, discuss some problems with those theories. First, there are problems with the retributive or desert theory. One objection is that giving offenders the harm they deserve isn't worth the cost of a criminal justice system. So a criminal justice system is very expensive. It takes a lot of time uh, and labor. Uh, mistakes are inevitable. Sometimes innocent parties are going to be punished. And the criticism is what would justify all these costs, these burdens to society, isn't merely the fact of giving 
offenders the harm they deserve. Instead, uh, the only thing that would justify these kinds of costs is some kind of benefit uh, to society. But according to the retributivist, punishment is justified regardless of whether it would do any good for society. Uh, instead, it's right in itself uh, to uh, give the guilty the harm they deserve. The second objection is that the kinds of penalties retributivism justifies don't look justified, at least in an, a range of cases. So on the face of it, uh, retributivism permits uh, lex talionis, the law of, of retaliation, or what's colloquially known as an eye for an eye. Um, if you gouge somebody's eye out, uh, the fitting penalty for that, the one that's proportionate to that deed, is having your own eye gouged out. But, so the objection goes, we don't want corrections officials maiming uh, uh, people, even if they deserve it. And similar remarks go for torturers. They might well deserve to be tortured, but we don't want, think it's justified for the state to torture offenders. And rapists might deserve to be raped, but again, we don't want to pay corrections officials to rape uh, prisoners. The claim here isn't that people don't deserve to be tortured or raped or maimed. Instead, uh, the objection is that sometimes they do, uh, 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 given what they've done, the horrible things they've done to other people. But the mere fact that somebody deserves such serious uh, uh, kinds of harms doesn't justify uh, the idea that the government would be permissible to impose those harms. In some ways, my criticisms of the retributive theory was that it, 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 uh, uh, it proves too much. Uh, it justifies penalties that are too harsh um, uh, and that actually look unjustified. And my criticisms of the protection theory are on the opposite side. Uh, they suggest that sometimes the protection theory uh, lets uh, criminals uh, get away with murder uh, or other serious crimes. So remember, according to the protection theory, punishment is justified only if it's expected to do some good in the form of preventing crime by deterring would-be criminals or incapacitating them. Um, and the first objection is that sometimes uh, punishment isn't necessary to prevent any crime, but it would be justified anyway. Uh, and an example uh, is a friend of mine who was once uh, sexually assaulted. Um, before the trial could come, uh, her rapist was uh, uh, hit by a bus uh, and paralyzed from the waist down. In that case, uh, punishment isn't necessary to prevent him from uh, engaging in any sexual assault or other serious crimes again. Uh, he's bound to a wheelchair, and so his crime days are over. Um, in this case, punishment isn't essential to prevent crime, but many of us will have the intuition that it would be justified, indeed required, for the state to punish him anyway, uh, despite the misfortune that has befallen him. Uh, and despite him not being in a position to commit any more serious crime. There would be an injustice if the government simply closed the case because uh, this fellow was involved in an accident. And parallel remarks go for the second objection, which is that uh, 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 the protection theory sometimes would justify punishing those guilty of serious crimes, but with intuitively light penalties. So it could be that if the state did decide to prosecute uh, this rapist and uh, gave him a mere six months in jail, that would be enough to uh, uh, prevent other people, uh, that would to, to scare off other people uh, from committing similar crimes. It's often said that it's not the severity of punishment that deters crime, but rather the certainty, the likelihood of getting caught. So perhaps if the government uh, caught this fellow, uh, did sentence him to something light, that would do the most the government could do, or would be enough to do uh, uh, all the government could when it came to deterring crime. But again, many of us would have the intuition that if somebody has committed rape, uh, they should get a much stiffer penalty than a mere six months in jail. Um, I wanna turn now, having articulated two prominent Western philosophies of punishment and uh, uh, spelled out some problems with them, to an alternative approach. 
Um, I draw on ideas that are salient in African philosophies and cultures more generally uh, to construct a novel theory of punishment, uh, one that avoids the problems I just articulated for the retributive and protection models. First, let me give you some background about uh, the idea of reconciliation as it has featured uh, in some African contexts. If we look at African peoples prior to colonialism, uh, they tended to be uh, small scale. Um, that is, uh, there weren't strangers in society. Uh, everybody knew everybody else. And in those settings, when there was wrongdoing or other conflict, uh, what tended to happen was that uh, the community or a group of elders would hear out those involved in the conflict. Um, offenders would be expected to uh, uh, feel remorse and apologize for their wrongdoing. They would be expected to make compensation to their victims. They would be expected to promise or otherwise commit to not doing the same thing again. And upon having done those things, they would be invited to rejoin society and uh, 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 things would move forward. So the phrase you'll often see uh, when these kinds of reconciliation practices are, are undergone is a theme of mending broken relationships. The thought is that a crime is what disrupts relationships, it's discordant, and uh, reconciliation of the sort I just articulated would mend what's broken or would harmonize uh, people once again. That's an example from a pre-colonial small-scale society, but contemporary large-scale uh, societies have also used uh, reconciliation to deal with crimes. And perhaps the most famous recent example is South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was tasked with responding to apartheid era political crimes, and in particular, those who committed human rights violations uh, during apartheid. The TRC's mode of dealing with uh, such offenders um, was the following. In the first instance, the TRC wanted to listen to victims. It wanted to get the victim's stories and give them a, a space to express themselves. Um, the second thing that the TRC did was to encourage offenders to disclose their crimes fully. So if offenders confessed uh, and didn't leave anything out about the nature of their political crimes, they were given amnesty by the TRC. That is, they couldn't be prosecuted either uh, uh, criminally uh, with an eye to punishment or even civilly uh, with an eye to a suit. In addition, uh, the TRC gave instructions to the government to compensate uh, victims for their losses and harms. And here the metaphor that's salient uh, with respect to uh, the TRC uh, is he healing the wounds of a nation. The thought is that by getting victims to uh, reveal how they've been mistreated, by getting offenders to disclose their misdeeds, uh, we get things out in the open uh, and that's cathartic or we're able to, to cleanse, uh, cleanse ourselves. What's salient uh, in those two examples I've given you is that punishment doesn't feature prominently. And indeed, often when philosophers think about reconciliation, it's advanced as an alternative to punishment. Um, punishment was present in the background in the TRC, right? If you were guilty of uh, a political crime under apartheid and you didn't reveal it, uh, then you were open to uh, being charged under normal, in the normal way uh, and to face punishment. But often, about the first, in the first instance, reconciliation was thought of as an alternative to punishment. And forgiveness is often associated with thought about reconciliation or what it's sometimes called restorative justice. However, I believe, uh, and I think many uh, viewers will agree with me, that in a particularly attractive sort of reconciliation would involve offenders routinely undergoing burdens. So I think that a desirable kind of reconciliation is one where offenders atone uh, for what they've done. And that involves uh, bringing burdens on themselves or allowing others to impose burdens on them. So I want to give an example of a married couple that isn't political or doesn't have anything to do with the government uh, to illustrate the point. Um, so imagine we have a married couple and suppose the husband uh, cheats uh, on his wife. 
and uh, relationships have problems, but let us suppose for the sake of argument, he wasn't justified uh, in cheating. Uh, and let us imagine that he had cheated with his boss. Uh, what should happen in this situation? Um, uh, uh, we can imagine that uh, uh, the couple could take a forgetting pill, right? We can imagine a hypothetical tablet that they could swallow that would make them forget uh, about the affair and just move on and reconcile in that sense. But I submit that that wouldn't be the most desirable kind of reconciliation. We can also imagine that the couple doesn't forget. They don't take a forgetting pill. They remember what happened, but that the wife immediately forgives uh, uh, the husband out of a sense of generosity. But that too, I submit, wouldn't be an ideal form of reconciliation. A much better one, I think you'll agree with me, is one where uh, uh, they sit down and hash things out, uh, where the man, uh, 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 lets the wife uh, speak her mind about how she's been hurt uh, by his behavior and suffers uh, uh, sympathetically uh, when she expresses her suffering. Uh, a better form of reconciliation would involve the man feeling guilty, feeling bad for what he did, um, as opposed to not feeling anything at all. A better form of reconciliation would have uh, the man uh, really look inside and do the hard work of therapy or perhaps couples counseling uh, to get to the root of the issue uh, and to make it clear to his wife that uh, he's addressing the motivation uh, for the cheating and won't do it again. And still more, uh, a better reconciliation would involve the husband taking on burdens. So if perhaps avoiding uh, his boss, not going on trips, uh, even though that would cost him uh, in terms of uh, his prospects of getting promotion uh, or otherwise flourishing on the job. In all those respects, uh, the husband would be taking on burdens um, and they would be burdens that are productive they would be expected to reform his character on the one hand and to uh, compensate or at least uh, uh, do something good for his wife. My proposal now is that we take that kind of model and apply it to the political level when it comes to the government. So here is a theory of reconciliatory sentencing. Um, that is meant to answer our two questions uh, that the retributive and protective models answered. And remember, the first question is, what is the point of punishment? What would justify punishing anyone in the first place? And according to the reconciliatory model, uh, there are two functions that punishment should serve. One of them is to disavow the past of offense. So think about how you would feel if you were uh, the victim of a serious crime and the government simply didn't chase down the offender or upon having caught the offender, wasn't interested at all uh, in punishing him. Uh, I think you would feel unimportant or treated as though you're unimportant. Um, and uh, so the function of disavowal or the function of punishment on a reconciliatory model is to counter that is instead to express disapproval of the offense, uh, uh, to treat the offender as responsible for his misdeeds, uh, to stand up for the victim and say, you shouldn't have been treated this way, uh, you should have been uh, treated better. Those expressive functions are part of the justification of punishment by this model. And they're supposed to be analogous to the husband taking responsibility um, and apologizing and expressing remorse uh, his disapproval of his own behavior. But the second function of punishment, according to my reconciliatory model, is to do some good, not in the form of incapacitating or deterring, but rather uh, uh, by reforming and making reparations. So my proposal is that the kinds of burdens that are placed on offenders are ex ones expected to improve offenders' characters so that they will not uh, uh, commit crime again in the future, and burdens that serve the function of compensating victims. So uh, by this model, we have both a backward and forward-looking dimension, right? On the one hand, we have uh, the judge looking into the past and saying a crime was committed. We have to express disapproval of it and stand up for the victim. 
Um, uh, and so for that reason, we impose a penalty. But in addition, there's a forward-looking element that says the kind of penalty that gets imposed should be one that's expected to improve the offender's character and to make the victim better off at the end of the day. Those ideas are quite different from saying that we're going to punish merely because the offender deserves to suffer or we're going to punish in order to deter others from committing crime. As for the second question of how to punish, uh, the answer is roughly that the worse the crime, the more labor intensive the reformation and reparation should be. So on the one hand, uh, the worse the crime, the more serious the crime, the stronger the government's disapproval should be, and so the stronger the penalty should be. And on the other hand, the more serious crime, the crime often the more harm that was done. And so the more labor and more compensation would be expected from the offender. These ideas are different from an eye for an eye and, uh, 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 and from the suggestion that the appropriate penalty on the protective model, recall, is whichever penalty will instill the most fear or most incapacitate would-be offenders. So all of that is, is fair, a fairly abstract statement of the view. Uh, here are some examples to illustrate it. And they're from a variety of contexts, from a university to domestic crime to uh, international war crimes. Um, I like, uh, I'm open to the idea that a reconciliatory approach might be appropriate for any of these contexts. First, consider a, a high school or a university. Suppose a student cheats on an exam. In high school, detention or expulsion would be a normal uh, response. At university, it would be expulsion in the first instance. Um, but instead of those responses um, that might be deserved, uh, that might serve the function of deterring crime, uh, my suggestion is that rather put the student to work. Uh, have that student teach new students about why they should not cheat on exams. That would serve the dual function of reforming uh, our guilty party's character and of compensating uh, paying back uh, uh, the university uh, for the injury to its reputation. For example, a second example, uh, consider burglary. Uh, instead of prison or a fine, uh, my suggestion is that one option to consider would again be to put the burglar to work, perhaps put a uniform on him and have him serve as a neighborhood watch guard to prevent other burglaries. Again, this would do the victim some good as opposed to the man simply rotting in jail or paying money to, in the form of a fine to the government. For a third example, suppose a woman drives junk, drunk. Uh, let's imagine uh, she didn't actually uh, end up causing any damage to, to person or property, uh, but she risked that damage. A reconciliatory sentence might involve a judge sentencing her to work for a time in a morgue to appreciate the potential consequences of her behavior and become more empathetic, uh, put herself in the shoes of those uh, uh, on whom she's imposing unjustified risks. And for a fourth example, uh, we can imagine a soldier who commits uh, war crimes. Again, the normal responses are prison or in extreme cases, uh, execution. But instead of those where victims don't benefit and where uh, uh, the offender isn't given any chance to rehabilitate, um, a reconciliatory approach might prescribe having him work on a farm with his hands, uh, not using machinery, uh, but rather uh, getting down uh, uh, into the muck uh, and uh, growing food for the community uh, that he has wronged. Hopefully you have a good example, uh, understanding of what I mean now by a reconciliatory approach to legal punishment. And what remains for me to do is to show how it avoids the problems that I had suggested face the retributive and protective models of punishment. So retribution first. Um, recall the first problem with retributivism is that a criminal justice system involves lots of costs in terms of money and labor and the risk of uh, mistakenly punishing innocent parties. And the suggestion was merely giving offenders the suffering they deserve for no future benefit isn't enough to justify those costs. We need to have some kind of burden 
to come from such a system. And the reconciliatory approach can capture that intuition, right? It says uh, uh, that punishment is justified, at least in part, because it's expected to rehabilitate an offender so that he won't offend again by his own accord. Uh, and punishment is justified as a way to compensate victims. Those are two concrete uh, good outcomes that might well justify the expense uh, uh, that comes along with a punishment system. Recall the second objection to the retributive model is that it entails that certain kinds of harsh penalties are justified when in fact they're unjustified for all we can tell. And notice in particular that maiming uh, prisoners and torturing them and raping them, even if they deserve it, uh, would not be justified by a reconciliatory approach because those kinds of treatments would not rehabilitate offenders and nor would they serve the function of compensating victims. Uh, they might well deter crime. Um, it could be, uh, I mean, they might well be deserved and they could even uh, serve as deterrents, but they're unjustified. And one explanation of why they're unjustified is that they don't do the specific good of rehabilitation and compensation. Finally, return to the problems facing the protection model of legal punishment. Um, and the first problem was that according to the protection rationale, it would be unjustified to punish somebody if it's not necessary to protect society, right? Uh, recall the case of the rapist who uh, uh, was injured severely in an accident after the crime. Uh, he won't be raping anymore, for example. And so by the protective model, there's no point in punishing him. But many of us have the intuition that punishment would still be justified. Why? Well, according to the reconciliatory approach, the government has to still disavow the crime. The government still has to treat the victims as important and stand up for the victim and express the judgment that the offender treated her in an objectionable way and to treat the offender as responsible for his misdeeds. So the disavowal element, uh, the expressive or backward looking element of the reconciliatory approach can explain why we would be justified in punishing somebody even when it's not necessary uh, to deter or incapacitate would be offenders. In addition, uh, the worse the crime, the greater the expression of disapproval that's appropriate, and hence the harsher the penalty should be. And so the reconciliatory approach also avoids uh, the objection facing the protection model that sometimes light penalties for severe crimes would do a sufficiently good job or even maximally good job of preventing crime. With that, I conclude. Um, I've spelled out two uh, uh, influential uh, uh, theories, Western theories of the justification of punishment. They've dominated uh, discussion uh, in Europe and North America for a good 200 years. Uh, I've spelled out some problems with that view that uh, even their adherents should appreciate and I expect many viewers uh, will appreciate. And then I drew on resources from the African tradition, ideas about reconciliation um, and uh, the kind of accountability that's intuitively appropriate for a desirable kind of reconciliation. And I've articulated an account of punishment uh, that's meant to disavow prior crimes, and, but where the burdens imposed to do that are productive. They're ones that do the good of reforming offenders and compensating victims. And I've suggested that they avoid the problems with the Western theories. And for that reason, I submit um, are worth taking seriously. Um, if you're interested in uh, further ideas about uh, uh, this debate, uh, one article of mine has already been published and is here on slide 13. And I have two more chapters uh, forthcoming uh, 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 next year. Thank you very much uh, for listening to me. And I look forward to seeing what questions and comments you might have. Thanks so much for that. That was really, really interesting. And I've got lots of questions. There are some questions already coming through on the YouTube. So please leave your questions in, in the comments below, or I think you can tweet with the hashtag RIP uh, manifesto, if you like. Um, I'm going to start with just a few questions on my own, Thad. You talked about the sort of Western theories and um, 
standard textbook stuff would say, you know, there's deterrence, there's protection, there's retribution, rehabilitation, maybe. Um, now, I, I, the impression I get is that, you know, if you're looking for one of these theories to do all the work, you're on a hiding to nothing that actually in practice, we justify uh, punishment for a mixture of these things. So in, in terms of the theory you're offering, are you offering this as kind of a justification to sit alongside those or the justification or maybe a hybrid where it's okay it's one justification amongst many but it's the main one it's the it's the key one how how, how do you see that working out um well i'd like to see how much i can get out of it um uh, when i do philosophy and i develop a theory in the first instance i'm trying to uh, uh, provide a comprehensive principle uh, that's going to do uh, all the work um, so uh, I'm in the first instance uh, would like to see whether it's sufficient on its own. Um, but here's one reason to think it, it might not be. Um, uh, suppose uh, an offender just refuses to submit to reconciliatory sentencing of the sort I've suggested. Um, so suppose uh, uh, the female drunk driver simply won't go work in the morgue um, uh, uh, or the student who cheats on the exam uh, simply won't uh, undertake the task of um, of teaching uh, uh, the next batch of students why it's wrong to cheat. In that case, um, I don't want to let these people go. Um, um, uh, and it suggests that we might need another reason um, uh, to punish uh, for not submitting to reconciliatory sentencing. Um, so perhaps we need some kind of special deterrence uh, uh, in those kinds of cases. That actually does link to a question we had from from the audience, which was, you know, how you would you, you were talking there about how you would deal with someone who basically wasn't responding to this. Um, another way of not responding is if you're a repeat offender, so a notorious repeat repeat offender. Again, presumably you just have to accept the the reconciliatory approach um, doesn't doesn't just won't work for that kind of person. There are only many so many times you can try for that reconciliation. I think that's fair. Um, so uh, after three or four attempts, uh, then we need something else. Um, however, it's not obvious to me that it would be punishment uh, that we want. Um, so I think there's a difference between imprisoning somebody for the sake of, uh, of punishing on the one hand, and then um, sequestering somebody for the sake of protecting society on the other. Uh, uh, so I can imagine if somebody is sort of out of control or simply won't, uh, isn't able uh, to reform uh, his character enough to uh, avoid committing crime, uh, then society would have an interest in removing him. Um, but that would be different from, uh, or that could well be different from a kind of punitive uh, imprisonment, uh, which is designed either to deter uh, generally or to uh, uh, inflict deserved uh, suffering. In fact, I mean, you, you talked about the um, Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission in, in South Africa. Um, how did they deal with people who just didn't engage with this process? I mean, did they just have to, did they resort to the more traditional forms of punishment or is that what happened? Yeah, that was the policy was uh, if you had committed political crimes during the apartheid era and you didn't participate in the process um, or you participated, but you didn't fully disclose uh, your misdeeds, then you were open to the normal uh, normal trial. Uh, you could still be sued. You could still be uh, punished. Um, not too many people were, in fact, prosecuted by the South African government, but some were. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I thought was very interesting, you, you talk about this importance of disavowal, um, and that's one of the things that is really important about reconciliation. Um, is that a kind of an independent, uh, as it were, desideratum of, of a, a kind of system of punishment, that independent of reconciliation? So yes, reconciliation is a good way to do this, but one of the tests about whether it works or whether it's justified is whether it succeeds in signaling to society, as it were, that we, we disavow this. Um, so do you think, do you, is that perhaps a, a freestanding reason for having a system of punishment? 
Yes, I think it is. And in fact, uh, uh, a former self about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, um, uh, had suggested that uh, the point of punishment simply was uh, expressing disapproval or censuring uh, misbehavior. Um, but lately, I've come to think that that's insufficient, um, uh, that uh, uh, ideally we want not merely to express disapproval, but do so in a particularly productive way uh, that's good for victims uh, and that will lead to reform on the part of the offender. Uh, I can see no reason to reject uh, those particular kinds of burdens. Um, uh, they seem to be only good and to do all the more uh, at justifying punishment. I mean, one thing that interests me about that element of, of disavowal, I think, is that you know, if we think about justice, yeah, I think in the Western tradition, uh, the, the, the justice is often treated as this kind of big abstract now, a kind of concept. And there's an idea of like ultimate justice, perhaps. We're trying to get towards some platonic ideal. Um, at the beginning of the talk, you were talking about in small scale societies and how really this is really deeply embedded in in social functioning so in a sense you you don't necessarily need a grand theory of justice it's about managing society it's as, it's as simple as that um is that a suggestion that you find uh, does that does that resonate with you or do you or do you think we we, we should think of justice as a a grand abstract sort of concept which exists independently of human society that we try to approximate to Good grief. Uh, I don't like the alternatives, I don't think. Um, uh, uh, I guess I do believe in principles of justice. I don't know that we can uh, find one perfect one that's going to fit all peoples in all times. Um, it makes sense to think uh, that there's going to be some kind of uh, contextual um, contextualization to the principles that apply, uh, given what else is going on in the society. That sounds right to me. Um, so I, I don't think they're going to be detached from society on the one hand, and I don't think ethics is just a matter of managing social conflict uh, uh, on the other. Right. Okay. I, I, I'm staying in a big thing there. And one question we got from the audience is, you know, what would be the reconciliatory sentence for murder? And I suppose the question there is that these, a lot of the examples you gave, you could kind of see how reconciliation was kind of possible and desirable. In, in the, how can it work with something as, as serious and as final as murder? Yeah, that's fair. And that is, uh, I do worry about uh, that kind of case. Um, um, but uh, the suggestion would be that the person, I mean, depending on the kind of what we mean by murder and, and the kind of unjustifiable killing that was involved. I mean, if we are supposing that it was you know, fairly egregious and malicious, uh, 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 wasn't a matter of, of negligence, uh, or mere recklessness, but but was intentional. Uh, I presume that's the force of the case. Um, in that sort of uh, situation, then we really do have uh, quite a lot of reform uh, that that individual needs to undergo. Uh, it's going to take quite a lot of, of, of therapy, uh, introspection, time spent with counselors. Um, uh, uh, the rehabilitation has got to be intense and presumably long lasting uh, for that person to have a hope of um, uh, of becoming a different kind of person, one who's who's going to be disinclined to perform uh, the same kind of action. Um, uh, so I think it's okay uh, uh, on the reform side, where we think that the function of a burden uh, should be to reform, then, then the theory holds up. Uh, the more difficult case is compensation. So in a case of murder, I mean, there are two, there are two issues. Um, one is the victim's gone. Uh, how do you compensate uh, in that sort of case? And uh, here I need to appeal to the idea that there are ways of, um, if not making dead people's lives go better, at least honoring them. Um, so on the face of it, uh, if the murdered person had children, one way to uh, compensate the dead person would be to do things uh, on behalf of, of his or her children. Um, uh, 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 and there I would, uh, 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 there would, again, be quite a lot of compensation uh, to be made uh, for having lost uh, a parent. Um, so in a way, the theory uh, holds up uh, reasonably well there uh, as well. Uh, the burden of losing a father or a mother is great. Uh, and so the burdens uh, that are going to be placed on the offender uh, to make up for that will be, have to be substantial. And I don't know if you, I mean, the, the, you, you may not have anything to say in response to this, but I was talking about that. I was, I was thinking about how 
so often when we hear people whose family members have been murdered and the trial comes up, how there seems to be a really quite deep rooted desire to see what people would say justice being done. And that does mean that person being locked up. I, often people want them locked up for the rest of their lives. And sometimes, of course, they, yes. they, want, they want them killed. You've done a lot of cross-cultural sort of work. Do you think that's a kind of a, a deep-rooted human fundamental, that we have this yearning for justice to kind of set the scales on an even keel, as it were? Or you know, it, are, are, do we have examples of perhaps societies or communities where people just don't have that such strong fundamental sense that that's what justice means? Yeah. Um, because if it is what justice means in a fundamental kind of almost intuitive way, then there is a sense in which the reconciliation approach is not going to be able to do everything, is it? It's not going to be able to satisfy that need for, you know, justice to be done in inverted commas, as people say. Yes. Look, I think there is probably a universal, uh, as universal, you know, as human nature gets at all universal, uh, 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 drive or instinct or desire for accountability. I think that's right. Um, we want people to uh, own up to what they've done and where they uh, won't own up. We want uh, the government or the public community to, to, uh, to make them atone or, or do, do the equivalent. Um, but that's different from simply seeing people suffer for the sake of uh, uh, having done wrong. Um, and I suspect uh, uh, many indigenous African societies are counterexamples uh, to this. Um, uh, uh, you will find some uh, 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 banishment and you will find occasional execution. So you will find extreme uh, penalties in these societies sometimes. But uh, from what I can tell, it's not, uh, to it's not for the sake of uh, giving people what they deserve um, or retaliating even. It's more often, it seems, uh, to protect society. It's got a protective function. Um, so uh, it would be witches or people perceived as witches who would be executed. Um, and the thought was, well, geez, we need to protect the community from these people and we've got no other uh, mechanism available. Um, it is a striking thing if you look at uh, philosophers and sociologists of, uh, of Africa, uh, the relative absence of retributive sentiments, um, yeah, but still a desire for accountability. Uh, and a desire, uh, and a, but it's not a pacifist, these aren't pacifist societies either. I mean, there's a strong belief in the justifiability of violence uh, in self-defense, for example. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, this might just be a, a comment <laughs> as an aside rather than a question, but I think what you're saying there, I think highlights the value of doing what we call comparative philosophy, because so often you hear discussions about justice and so forth, and people are bringing in intuitions about what they take to be fundamental and universal. And often, you know, it, it turns out that if you look a little bit wider, these things aren't so so universal. You say that retributive sense, which which we take to be, you know, it has to be explained, it has to be met in some way. Maybe that that isn't the case. There's another thing that I wanted to talk about, and we got some questions from the audience which relate to this i'm very struck by you know this idea that the, the function is to mend broken relationships uh, heal wounds um mm -hmm. and when you're thinking about punishment and justice in those ways you're very much thinking about the community you're thinking about the whole and you're thinking about not as individuals as atomized individuals you're thinking about them as members of, of communities it seems to me that you know a lot of people say that the Western tradition has become very atomized. It's been very much focused on the individual. And then when we think about punishment, we're very much thinking about what does this person deserve? Uh, how should we treat this person? And that may extend to thinking about the victim, perhaps. But we don't have that idea of uh, justice being about social cohesion in, in, in the broader sense. Um, so first of all, I think, you know, it, it, I don't know if you've got anything to say about that, whether you agree uh, that's broadly correct, and whether there's anything else to say about how important it is to really bring that uh, relational aspect to, to, to our thinking about justice. Hmm. I mean, I think ultimately what's driving this approach to, uh, 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 to the philosophy of punishment I'm suggesting is a sense that uh, 
we, a, a cohesive society is a better society. Um, and uh, that ethics is a matter of, of relating in communal ways. Um, I think that drives a lot of the ethic. Um, and so my fellow African philosophers who, who take those values to be fundamental often enough are going to be drawn uh, towards this uh, theory. But um, what I hope is the case is that many viewers of the talk, uh, even if they're based in the West, found something compelling about it. Um, so even if there's a kind of individualism uh, that's, that's salient in Western culture, um, uh, in the background, often enough, uh, we recognize that uh, we value family, uh, we value uh, uh, collegial uh, uh, workplaces, uh, we value neighborhoods. Um, and if we want those kinds of relationships, um, it's, it's not so clear that uh, uh, deterrence or desert are going to play very central roles. Um, so if you think uh, in terms of a family, um, if you start uh, punishing people to deter um, or punishing people simply because they deserve it, uh, that family is going to be in trouble. Um, so in some ways, uh, the ethic is appropriate for a, a community. Um, but I also think it's appropriate for a kind of society that wants to become more, more of a community. Yeah. Okay. It's really, really interesting. There was a question here from, uh, which I'm going to sort of summarize. They, 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 they're picking up this point that the reconciliatory approach being grounded in mending relationships. There we go. And the question here then is, is whether the, we can justify the enforcement of rule of law. Um, I've been looking at this question, trying to sort of work out if I understand it properly. So apologies mm, to the question mm. if I don't. But I suppose the, the, the point of the question is this. We do think that the rule of law is in itself very important for society, that um, in order for society to function properly, everyone has to respect the rule of law. And that therefore, you know, breaking the rule of law is sufficient justification for holding someone to account for it. And I guess the questioner is thinking, I don't see how that... Um, fits in with a reconciliatory approach. Is, is there a way of, is, is a rule of law an important concept in your approach? I would have thought, I mean, if, if uh, uh, I take the underlying principle of the rule of law to be that we all have an equal dignity. Uh, we all have an equal worth. Uh, in saying that no one's above the law, we're saying that we're all uh, equals as citizens. Um, and I think that fits uh, quite naturally with this kind of uh, uh, approach to punishment. Um, another way of seeing what's underlying the theory is a certain conception of human dignity, uh, but a relational conception. Uh, the thought that what's important about us uh, isn't that we've got a soul or the mere fact that we're alive or that we're uh, uh, potentially autonomous, but rather that we have the ability to relate to each other uh, in certain even-handed ways. Um, so for anybody uh, to break the law, uh, that's in some ways uh, treating uh, uh, himself or herself as special, uh, as worth more than others. And so I think at least the underlying values of, of the theory can account for the importance of why we would want to uh, treat everyone uh, as equal before the law. Yeah, so I suppose when you don't respect the rule of law, you are, as it were, breaking that social contract. And so there's a need for you to kind of reconcile yourself to 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 that social contract to 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 society yeah, that's in some yeah and there's another question here from uh, uh medi I might be mispronouncing the name apologies if i have done that which i think is an interesting one he's talking about the roots of crime what about looking to possible roots of crime now people often talk about that as being important um tony blair a lot of us in the uk may, may remember when the new labor government came in in towards the end of the 20th century, uh, they had this slogan which was tough on crime and tough on the causes of crime. So the idea mm. being that the conservative approach was always just attacking crime and, and, and not the causes. Um, so, so as the question here is, uh, it, the question has been asked, does society hold any responsibility in, in those mm. crimes? Um, so again, is that do, do you think your reconciliatory approach can, as it were, again, accommodate that, that sense we sometimes have that yeah. it's actually not just about the perpetrator of the crime. S society has failed every time someone commits a crime and society shares some of the responsibility. Yeah, I think in two ways. Um, 
So uh, uh, traditionally, uh, if you look at many indigenous uh, African societies, when we, we see reconciliation in action there, it's not simply the victim versus uh, the offender uh, and then a sort of council of elders uh, uh, judging. Um, in addition, uh, the family members of the offender or the, the uh, uh, the guilt of the uh, person labeled guilty or the potential offender uh, and the victim, the families of the victim are also there. And the thought is, uh, seems to be that, of course, uh, the offender uh, has primary responsibility uh, for what he or she has done, but um, uh, those close to him, uh, uh, his family, uh, also bear some responsibility uh, for his misdeeds. Uh, 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 he lives with them, uh, he's close to them, they have some influence on him, and it's a collective endeavor, as it were, uh, to set things right. Um, so I think that's a fascinating part of many uh, uh, indigenous African societies, and it strikes me as perfectly sensible. Uh, uh, and I think uh, it's another respect in which we might reconsider uh, some of our Western approach to justice. That's another kind of individualism we might be led to question. So that's, that's one uh, idea. The second thing I need to say is that uh, in some ways, crime control is less of an issue on, by reconciliatory sentencing. So we've got the dis disavowal element and the compensate uh, for the victim uh, element, and those aren't a matter of preventing crime in any way, really. Uh, all that's really going on uh, with regard to crime prevention is the thought that we should reform uh, the offender's character. And so uh, one concern you might have is, uh, uh, is this going to be enough uh, to keep crime under control? And so my response has got to be in the first instance that we should uh, use a different part of the legal system uh, for crime control, namely the legislative side. Uh, and we want to look at uh, uh, social policy uh, and law as, concern, uh, as concerns the distribution of resources to try to reduce crime in the first place. So it should be uh, uh, the function not of the judiciary, I'm suggesting, but rather the legislature uh, to enact laws and policies that are likely to reduce crime. So to address the roots of it, uh, which often uh, have to do with addiction, uh, uh, mental illness, uh, uh, economic inequality, uh, and similar kinds of things. Yeah, that reminds me actually of arguments around um, health policy as well, because uh, again, people often say that we talk about uh, having a health service. It's actually an illness service. And uh, if you want to improve the health of a nation, a lot of what has to be done has to be done by uh, legislation and, and initiatives, which are not the function of the health department at all. They're about making sure people have enough money, access to services and so forth. So I think that, yeah. that, that's very interesting, too. I'll ask you a question about responsibility. Um, one thing that strikes me is when people are talking about justifications of punishment and so forth in the Western tradition. A lot of the problems people have with punishment is uh, problems around responsibility because it's kind of assumed that justification, punishment is only really justified if the person who is being punished is responsible for that in the sense of having this notion of, of free will. You know, Now this is a real can of worms, so I apologize if, if uh, you don't want, to be, don't want to be led down here. But of course, because we have many reasons for thinking that people do not have free will in the naive sense of the word, in the sense that they, they're not the sole originators of their actions or their personalities, that they are to a certain extent products of their history and so forth, that therefore mm. that makes the whole notion of punishment problematic. And people think that if we acknowledge that free will is in the extreme view, an illusion, or in the less extreme view, not what it seems. The whole justification for punishment goes out of the window. But I think you did mention responsibility in there. So wh what kind of notion of responsibility do we need for the reconciliatory approach? What kind of responsibility does a person have to acknowledge? I think you talked about people having to acknowledge that. Um, or... or <laughs> And if that's, I, I, you, I feel totally free to just reject that question as too big and for another day, because I know it's a huge one. It is a big one. Um, uh, I, I'm inclined to, uh, I, I'm not sure I've got uh, an account of that that somehow is uh, uniquely tied to, to this theory of, of why punishment is justified. 
Um, but I'm inclined to think that um, the relevant sort of responsibility is is one that would uh, look. It's it's clearly possible for people to treat each other disrespectfully, um, and it makes perfect sense to hold people accountable for that. Um, uh, uh, it makes perfect sense to uh, 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 to yell at people, uh, for example, if they're treating you disrespectfully and they won't listen to a soft voice. Um, it's perfectly fine to uh, shove people in self-defense if it's necessary to protect you. Uh, these are common sense uh, uh, reactions uh, to in, uh, interference or intrusiveness or disrespect. Um, and I don't see punishment as qualitatively different from those clearly justifiable reactions. Um, uh, so I think, I think uh, the kind of critic you have in mind has a mighty big uh, bullet to bite uh, if he or she is going to suggest that we don't get angry um, or we don't shove people in self-defense because people aren't responsible for their behavior. Um, and I doubt, I doubt, I mean, maybe some will bite the bullet, uh, but uh, uh, at this point, I would just want to show that they've got uh, quite some uh, counterintuitive implications uh, uh, that uh, they're stuck with. Okay, got a couple of other questions coming up from, from audience. One is by Dr. Mayor Alif. Um, actually, we'll, okay, we'll, we'll do this one first. It's come up on the screen. Um, would you consider getting rid of mandatory sentences and how does intent or the possibility, these are two questions really, possibility of potentially committing a crime fall into the reconciliatory approach, possession of a firearm, et cetera. But um, there are two questions there. Mandatory, does mandatory yeah. sentencing not really work in this approach? That's the first one. Let's take that one first. Uh, I think that's, I think uh, probably a direct implication is that mandatory sentencing is unjust. Um, mm. In some ways, reconciliatory sentencing is quite burdensome on the judiciary because the sentence should be tailored uh, to the individual um, in the light of his or her particular uh, uh, weaknesses of character and in the light of the particular wrongful harm that was done to uh, the victim uh, and what it is that would uh, help make up for that harm. So sentences need to be tailored uh, to uh, particularities of the offender and the victim. And that, on the face of it, is incompatible with uh, a mandatory sentencing approach, which, uh, which of course, is, is uniform um, and is designed precisely to abstract away from those kinds of details. Um, so I think they're incompatible, and I frankly think that that's uh, a plus of the theory. Uh, on the face of it, the only thing that would justify mandatory sentencing is, is some kind of uh, deterrence. Um, um, uh, and it's not at all clear that, in fact, uh, uh, they have deterred uh, uh, when they've been used in South Africa or the United States. Yeah. And the second thing um, as for the, the... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. this is about, you know, tent, um, possession of a firearm, things like this, where I guess nothing's actually been done yet, but there's an intention to do harm. And we consider these crimes uh, in most systems and most people think it does make sense to punish people for them. Does how does that fit into the reconciliatory approach or does it not? Yeah, um, I think it does. I mean, it's, uh, uh, if, if it makes sense to make that against the law, and that is if we don't want people attempting murder um, uh, or planning murder, um, uh, then we've got something to disavow. We've got something to say, look, uh, offender, you've acted wrongly. Uh, we disapprove of your action. We need to distance ourselves from it. We need to express to you firmly that uh, this is not the kind of behavior uh, we expect from you. Um, in addition, presumably, there's some reform that the individual needs to undergo um, in order to uh, uh, be less likely uh, to do uh, similar actions in the future. I think the tricky part is that we don't seem to have a victim. Um, if you've just simply possessed the firearm or you've attempted to kill somebody and you failed, um, uh, we don't have a victim on the face of it. Uh, but we still have the two other elements um, uh, of, uh, of reconciliatory sentencing that, that would be in play. Um, and maybe there's some sense of uh, 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 these individuals having wronged the public more abstractly. Um, mm. So I'm, I'm thinking of crimes like counterfeiting, um, uh, or cheating on your taxes. Uh, there's no particular, you know, no, no specifiable victim uh, uh, with these kinds of crimes. We want to say well, it's the public in general that's, that's wronged. Um, and so if that kind of thing makes sense for an attempted murder or a, uh, a possession of a firearm, maybe there's some role for compensation as well. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess you do. You do certainly have broken relationships in 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 that situation. I'm going, thinking back to your initial domestic example. Um, if somebody, mm-hmm. as it were, finds their partner on their way to the hotel for mm-hmm. the liaison, <laughs> they've yeah. already broken the relationship, right? I mean, the fact that they haven't yet done what they intended to do is, is, is in a sense, the, the relationship's already been broken and needs healing. Um, there's a question here from, say, Dr. Mio Alif, which is about, uh, can you say anything about punishments and notions of saving face? And I guess the reason I picked that out is that when people talk about saving face, I know people talk a lot about difference between shame and guilt cultures. Um, mm. I don't know whether that's a distinction that you particularly approve of or, or, or find useful. Um, is 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 there any connection? And if there isn't, we just say no and move on to the next question. Between uh, a society which favours the reconciliatory approach that you advocate and any uh, emphasis on shame or guilt within those cultures? Right. I'm not sure what to say. I mean, the one thing that comes to mind is that... Uh, um, in the talk, when I tried to motivate the idea that disavowal is important, um, I, I urged the viewer to think about how uh, uh, she would feel if she were the victim of a crime and the government didn't uh, try to track down uh, the offender or upon having captured the offender, wasn't at all interested in, in placing any sort of burden uh, on him. Um, and I think there'd be a kind of humiliation uh, that we would feel uh, in that situation. We would feel treated as unimportant. Um, and so I think punishment is a way of acknowledging uh, people and acknowledging their importance and acknowledging their equal dignity. So in that sense, I think a punishment's essential uh, for people to save face in, in that sense. Okay. Well, we'll keep, we've just got a few more questions, perhaps, before we, before we wrap up. Um, you did mention the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We talked about that before. Um, now, for those of us not in South Africa, we know about it, we've heard about it, we don't know a lot of details. And I think a lot of us know that it wasn't without controversy. It's often held up as a, 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 a great or a very good process which helped in lots of ways to heal the country. But we also hear about there are plenty of people who have not been satisfied by it, who, who have not been happy with it. Um, is there anything you can say about the, some of the things people weren't happy with about that process and whether that translates into reasons why people perhaps may not be as happy with your approach as, as you would like them to be? Or... Hmm. Um, I think the reasons people weren't happy with that approach actually support uh, uh, the kind of uh, account approach to punishment that I'm that I'm trying to advocate. Um, uh, interestingly, so there were two two main worries that people have had with the TRC. One is that the architects of apartheid uh, uh, got away. Um, they they didn't pay any real cost whatsoever. Um, uh, they weren't sued. Uh, they weren't punished. Uh, they got to keep all of their uh, unjustly gained wealth. And so there wasn't accountability. And of course, uh, uh, the retributivist is going to say, well, look, they didn't receive the suffering they deserve. Uh, but by my theory, uh, the claim would be, well, no, uh, that wasn't the problem. Uh, it was rather there wasn't the right sort of reconciliation. There wasn't a reconciliation that involved productive burdens. So if uh, the apartheid architects had been put to work and put to work for the sake of compensating uh, 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 black people who had suffered as a result of apartheid policies, I think, uh, which is what my theory would recommend, uh, I think there wouldn't have been uh, nearly as much of that complaint. The other major complaint with uh, the TRC was that uh, uh, victims were not compensated. Um, so the TRC recommended um, individual uh, 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 disbursements, uh, I mean, uh, uh, disbursements to particular individuals who were, who, uh, were specific um, uh, victims of human rights violations, but the government uh, hasn't done a good job uh, of paying those out. In fact, it still hasn't uh, compensated everybody uh, whom the TRC suggested be compensated. Uh, and then more broadly speaking, in terms of just the, the, the society as a whole, uh, the collective injustice, apart from uh, the human rights violations done to particular individuals, so, uh, South Africa is still uh, very unequal. Uh, it's still very poor. 
uh, and uh, the distribution of wealth is still by and large uh, racially skewed. Uh, so that uh, if you're a white person, uh, on average, uh, in terms of income, you make five or six times uh, what, uh, what a black person or black family does. Um, and so the fact that victims didn't, weren't made better off uh, uh, substantially uh, uh, in the wake of the TRC has been another major complaint. Uh, but again, my fear of punishment is supposed to address uh, precisely that uh, in the form of making uh, offenders uh, go out of their way and to undergo uh, burdensome ways of compensating victims. Yeah, so it's interesting. So in, in one respect, the TRC is the most visible example of the broad approach we're advocating, but actually it falls short of, of, of really fully exemplifying it. So unfortunately, there's sort of the most well-known example you can point to isn't quite <laughs> what you'd like to, to to advocate in that way. And one person has asked whether it's that possible. That is true. To that is true. But but uh, but because uh, of the dissatisfaction with the TRC, um, I think it's perfectly it's perfect. It makes sense to say, look, this was an in, uh, a, an inadequate reconciliation. Uh, we can do we can find a better way of of uh, effecting reconciliation. Uh, and I would I would point the viewer to the kind of uh, reconciliation policy that uh, the Colombian government uh, has adopted. Uh, it hasn't quite put it into practice, but has at least adopted uh, in respect of the FARC, uh, the leftist guerrillas, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to help settle the, the longstanding civil war there. Um, and I forget the phrase that they use, but uh, what I'm calling reconciliatory sentencing, uh, you will find in the policy um, uh, as a, a victim-centered uh, approach to reconciliation. Thanks. So somebody's asked whether it's possible to get in touch with you after the lecture to ask further questions. Um, would you be happy for people to contact? You can look you up and send you an email. It's all it's all there. Absolutely. Publicly. Oh, it's most welcome. Um, Please. Yes. Look me up. Yeah. <laughs> OK, here's probably the, the final audience question. Um, does reconciliation make more sense for a small homogenous society? I mean, you, the examples you gave were from traditional societies and they're smaller and more uh, homogenous. Do you do you do you think that there are any problems in expanding that model to the larger, more heterodox sort of diverse communities we have now? It depends what you mean by reconciliation. Um, so some people have a very narrow sense of reconciliation that involves, um, that involves forgiveness or that involves um, uh, sort of the restoration of good feelings and goodwill between people. And if that's what you mean by reconciliation, then it's, it's probably not going to be appropriate as public policy uh, and will be appropriate only for uh, uh, small scale settings such as a family. Um, however, I don't think reconciliation essentially involves forgiveness or, or the restoration of, of goodwill between people. Um, I think intuitively it's possible for people to reconcile and they still have some lingering resentment. Um, uh, I might have a fight with a colleague, um, uh, but if we hash it out uh, and we take responsibility uh, uh, for our mistakes um, and we apologize and we go out of our way to make amends to each other, uh, then I and we go on our merry way and continue to uh, 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 be good colleagues, as, uh, fulfill our academic work, then my intuition is we've reconciled and we've done a good job of reconciling. And that's so even if we continue to uh, uh, feel uh, some lingering resentment and we haven't really full and fully forgiven uh, in our hearts. Um, so I think reconciliation, uh, if it makes sense there, uh, then it, it's, it's possible on a broader scale as well. Last, last question from, from me. Um, if people just look at the title of this and they just weren't paying a lot of attention, uh, you know, reconciliation, this whole kind of approach, I think a lot of people think this sounds like the sort of bleeding heart, liberal kind of position. It's mm -hmm. soft. It's a basically a soft position. I don't think what you've said suggests it is soft. And would, but would you like just, just to final words about to sort of perhaps reiterate perhaps why you don't think this should at all be seen as a soft approach to justice and punishment? Yeah, I think it's uh, a lot of it has to do with that idea that a desirable uh, kind of reconciliation involves burdens. Uh, 
So if we think of a married couple that have had a fight and the, the man has cheated on, on the wife, uh, a desirable kind of reconciliation involves him taking on burdens, him feeling bad, uh, him uh, uh, undergoing the pain of listening to how his wife has suffered, uh, him making sacrifices to make sure he wouldn't uh, repeat the behavior. Um, that's a perfectly uh, sensible notion of reconciliation, a familiar one. Uh, it's hard for me to imagine somebody who would, who would think that's inappropriate in some way. Um, but it involves burdens. It involves pain on the part of uh, uh, the wrongdoer. Um, so if we think wrongdoers must atone, uh, then we should, uh, by extension, think it's, it's appropriate uh, for society to make them do so uh, if they're not inclined to do so on their own. So I'm trying to capture a lot of retributive sentiments. Um, uh, I don't want an eye for an eye. Uh, I don't want that kind of extreme kinds of penalties. Uh, but people need to be held accountable for their behavior. Um, and a desirable way of reconciling is, is to do so. Well, look, thanks ever so much, Thad. We're going to draw it to close soon. And we have some, if you've enjoyed this evening, which I'm sure you have, please do tell other people about the events we're running. Tell them that they can catch it again, that although they may have missed it, that this will be on YouTube uh, for them to watch and share with their friends. We've got some events coming up, which hopefully will be some displaying on your screen soon. Uh, the Cardiff Annual Lecture, we run annual lectures in, in London, Cardiff, Edinburgh and Dublin in most years. And thankfully, a lot of these are going to go online. So the first is 3rd of November, Javi Carell, The Phenomenology of Social Distancing. So a very, very topical talk there that's at eight o'clock uh at greenwich mean time um patricia churchland is giving the annual lecture which has been running since the late 1990s in london on the subtitle being good natured mammalian genes and the origin of morality that's the 5th of november just a couple of days later at 6 30. and then the next talk in this series the day after so we've got a very busy week next week basically it's all happening next week um on top of the american election so you'll need diversion from that maybe um, Leia Yippie is uh, arguing for amnesty for immigrants, 6th of November at 6.30 GMT. Um, you subscribe to the, to the YouTube channel or also you subscribe for, uh, join, sign up for the events through Eventbrite and you'll get sent a reminder nearer the time. A, a few thanks from me. I'd like to thank behind the scenes uh, Matt Titterson, who's organised all the te technology this evening and it's our first time we've run it and I've been very relieved and happy to see how it's gone so thank you to him. Thank you to Absent Friends, Foils Bookshop, we ran our events in their event space uh, last year and they really helped us to reach a new audience and it's really sad we can't have those in-person events this year. We appreciate their support and hope to be working with them again in the future and also to James Garvey, Royal Institute of Philosophy, uh, who basically does pretty much everything apart from what I'm doing right now. Uh, thank you for turning up. But also, finally, thank you again to Thaddeus Metz. Really, really interesting talk. Lots to think about. And um, come back again uh, to our channel soon and, and see more in this series. Thank you. Good night. Thanks very much, Julian. Thanks for the questions as well. <laughs>